We're here with Rocco Camisso, a, uh, a superstar in the cable industry and the only immigrant to be a CEO of a, of a cable company. Tell us a little bit about your journey, how you came here when you were 12 years old. I was 12. My father had already immigrated to America, uh, brought us the rest of the family to the first Pennsylvania and then the Bronx. After four years in this country, I got lucky with a scholarship to Columbia University, played soccer there, and, uh, and that was, uh, you know, really the door that opened up for me and permitted to get later on to the financial community, got an MBA from Columbia, and uh, in 1978, locked out and started lending money to the cable business. And it's been my passion, love, uh, since then, almost 40 years. And you grew up in the cable industry with really the industry, kind of the, the greats, those first tier who really expanded the industry, right? My heroes, you know, people that I learned a lot from. I was able to deal. But I always told people, you know, when they used to put me in, uh, give me a responsibility to call in the big companies like CBS, RCA, the New York Times, I dreaded them. I did not want to go there, you know. But when they said, go and call with these little cable guys, you know, the John Malone's of this world, the Alan Garys, uh, the Chuck Dolans, I love those guys. That's who I learned from. And that's where I, you know, that's put, put something in my blood, I guess, that... Uh, made me a loyal, loyal follower, committed follower of the industry. Well, they all had to hustle, right? Because it was all, they were used to be called the Wild West, the Cowboys, right? Cowboy, they hustle, hustle. When you, when you have to borrow money and then have to repay it, you know, and then in order to grow, you have to borrow more money. No kidding, that was hustling. And you had to prove yourself in a very short period of time. This is not... These were not investment grade companies. This was not corporate America. This is people that, you know, literally had to do everything. They were financial people, operating people, technologists, workers, leaders, franchise wars, right? During the 70s, a lot of franchises had to be obtained. And, uh, you know, and they became great leaders of their own companies, you know, each, each on their own rights. So then in the mid-90s, uh, regulation, uh, industry starts getting heavily regulated. Kind of a difficult time to start a new company, but you, but you did. Well, before then, I went to work for Cablevision Industries as the CFO. And my boss, and I'm talking about now Alan Gary at Cablevision Industries, headquartered in Liberty, New York. I uh, had built a phenomenal company with 1.3 million customers. Um, and largely as a result of the re-regulation of our business back in 1992, followed up by a new commissions that decided to decrease our rates by 17%. You know, uh, put the nail on the coffin, says, enough of the stuff, and decided to sell out. Um, I was still 45 years old, and uh, I had a strong, strong belief uh, put in a piece of paper called the window of opportunity that now is the time to buy, now is the time to get involved because things were pretty lousy, things were bad. Um, and uh, I used the contrarian viewpoint to get reinvolved in the cable business, this time as a CEO, founder, owner, you know, and, and I did that done that for the last 20 years. In fact, this week, uh, we'll, next week, we'll commemorate the um, yeah, 20 year anniversary of the time, day that we bought our first system in Ridgecrest, California. And you focused on rural areas to begin with, right? Well, look, I could not have become another Comcast Time Warner, Cox, you know, whose markets were predominantly the major cities. And I strongly felt then and today that, uh, you know, I could buy smaller markets um, because there's, there's a huge supply demand imbalance. The bigger companies wanted the bigger markets. There was nobody there that really wanted the smaller markets. And that's where we segmented the market. We targeted that market. And our whole, uh, you know, our whole philosophy was to buy under, underserved, undermanaged, uh, underperforming, cable systems in smaller markets, buy at a cheap rate, right? But use the gains, right? And reinvest it into the market. So sooner or later, we could give the customers 
in the areas that we serve, the same level of service that the big city would have, and we did. So, for instance, you know, of all the acquisitions that we did in our first six years of our existence, you know, we ended up with 700 head ends. Well, today we have two. One, to make sure if the first one goes dead, the second one is around. We laid out 600,000 miles, friend miles of fiber on the ground. Everything is interconnected. And in these very, very, very small markets, by the way, markets that not even Google wants to go to, okay? Because God forbid they should go and serve a community with 50 customers. We do, but they don't, okay? That, uh, you know, we made them econom economically viable so we could behave and frankly, and give those customers the same level of service than any other place in America. And one of the things, uh, being from the finance side, uh, you understood the debt, and, and, and you made some interesting comments about debt and how it really is your credibility, right, that you pay it back. Not only we pay it back, we have to refinance it. And the day that refinancing comes, nobody's going to give you money if you screw up in between, right? So we have, uh, look, we, uh, just in the last 12 months, we got upgraded by S&P and Moody's, right? Uh, we happen to enjoy the lowest cost of debt capital so in the entire cable sector, okay? And I'm very proud of that because we're not of the quality, at least from credit ratings, as some of the larger companies like Comcast and Time Warner, they're investment grade, we're not, yet we have one of the lowest uh, cost of debt capital in the business. Now, with that, the importance of that, that if you pay less on your interest rate, that means you got more money left to spend it on the customers, on your systems. And in that respect, our company, just in the last 20 years, not only did we spend $3.6 billion to acquire all the systems that we've acquired, but we also spent $4.2 billion in capital expenditures over the last 20 years. That's almost $300 million, you know, per year, okay, to take care of the systems for the customers that we acquire. And that's money that's in the infrastructure here in the United States. Not only, not only the infrastructure, but the people too, okay? Because just in the last, uh, you know, while everybody else was either going to China, Japan, Mexico, or whatever, or, or uh, you know, laying off people left and right. And, you know, you know, back in 2008, you know what happened, right? With the housing crisis. And, uh, yeah, Mediacom grew its employee base in 2008. Mediacom still uh, increases its employee base. In fact, in the last uh, 15 years, I think uh, the number of employees have gone from 3,200 to 4,600, 1,200 new employees. And when is the government going to turn around and say, Rocco, thank you? Okay, the only, we only get criticisms, you know, from the powers to be in government. You know, never a thank you for the work that we have done and what we have brought to, to small town America. And that's huge because having people in the communities they serve makes a difference because they can identify what needs to be done, right? We're local, 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 local. Our people... You know, in fact, they're so local that most of our people in the technical end don't even have to come to the office. You know, we send them a work order, and they take care of their own neighborhoods. And so we, we're the only industry really in America probably, you know, um, that daily interacts face-to-face -face with our customers. You know, we're not like, I mean, when's the last time that Google or Apple sent you know, a technical person to a home to take care of an issue. It's Mediacom, it's companies like Mediacom that typically sends out their employees to take care of any problems that the customers have. And while we get blamed a lot, we never get credit, okay, for the little things that we do on a daily basis. What I find especially interesting is the fact that you've uh, expanded every year, you've expanded your revenue, but at the same time, the mix of where that revenue is coming from has drastically changed. You mentioned your video uh, we lost percentage. We your customers, um, you know, largely because of programming costs. You know, when anyone in government says, you know, we're not competitive, well, talk to Rocco, you know, what monopoly you know, it's able, to, you know, my monopoly wants to lose customers. Well, we lost 700,000 customers on the video side of the equation over the last 
you know, 12, 13 years. Now, thank God we had other businesses, like the broadband business, right? We introduced phone in the markets where we operate, and we now have the commercial business services side, and we made it up for that. A combination of losing the video customers, you know, and getting broadband phone and business services customers, given the company, you know, a pretty unique record, never having had a down year in revenues in my entire career in the cable business. So, in my entire career in MediaCom, right. Uh, so, looking forward then, what possibilities do you see for the industry in terms of new services, or what's going to drive the needle in, you know, three, four, five years from now? Well, broadband, broadband, broadband is pretty important. You know, over the top, you know, may in some form replace linear programming, right, uh, on the video side of the equation. Uh, hopefully there will be more a la carte, more skinny bundles, more, more programming permitted as permitted by the programming companies. You know, it's not the media company doesn't want to do it. We're just not permitted by the big programming companies to do these things. You know, have the ability to give the customers what they really want, okay? Uh, I think you're going to see, you know, what the phenomenal infrastructure we have in place. We're going to increase and keep on increasing the broadband speeds. You know, next couple of weeks we may ourselves make some big announcements. Um, and, uh, and we're going to try to uh, go even deeper into the markets where we serve. So in the past, you know, I, unless you have had, had, because it's very capital intensive, right? So if you do a model plan, you better have potentially X amount of customers in front of that plant, right? Otherwise, you're not going to do cable. You may rely on satellites. Well, you know, maybe with the new phenomenon with the broadband, you know, uh, maybe we could rationalize, you know, extending our plan to communities where in the past cable was not there. Excellent. Well, I really appreciate your time. <laughs>